Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's L Chat on growing a memorable and successful blog. I'm really excited to have Kate Bryan joining in with me today, um, the blogger behind the Small Things blog. And I've actually been following along with Kate for probably over three years now. She is one of the blogs I've consistently kept up with, and um, I just find her site so helpful and so refreshing out there in the world of blogs. Um, we're going to jump into the questions in just a second, and I know that. Um, you all have a lot of questions for Kate, too, so we're going to leave about 20 minutes at the end to try to answer as many of those as possible. Um, I just want to show you around the window, and I also want to make sure that you all can hear me. So let me know in the comments that you can see and hear everything okay. Um, I would appreciate that. In the meantime, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Crowdcast, the the platform we're using for this webinar. Um, there's a comment section. It seems like most of you have found that already. Feel free to say hello. Tell me where you're tuning in from today. Um, it looks like we have people all over the states and from other countries too, which is always really neat. Um, also, it, down below this window, there's the question section. So that's where you can ask questions. There's also a really neat feature where you can vote questions up. So as you're looking through those questions and you see any that you really want to see answered, go ahead and vote them up and we'll answer them in order of the number of votes. Um, so there's also a poll section. We don't have any polls just yet. We might, we might throw a poll up there in just a couple minutes. Um, but yes, can you all see and hear me okay? I want to make sure. Awesome. Okay. Sweet. Thank you for letting me know in the comments. All right. So without further ado, we're going to jump right in. Hey, Kate, and thank you for joining us today. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Yes. Yeah, so um, for those who might not have run across the Small Things blog before, can you just tell us a little bit about the Small Things and um, and what it is? Yeah. So the, the Small Things blog is a blog I've written for the past five years. I started it in 2011. Um, and it's sort of, it's, it's changed, of course, as my life has changed. It originally started out as a hair and beauty blog. My background is in doing hair. I did that for about 10 years. And then um, over the course of writing the blog, I've, I was married when I started it, but I've had two kids. So now I describe it more in general as a beauty, hair, beauty, and lifestyle blog. So I've, I've sort of opened up the categories a little bit more from that, but it definitely airs on the side of hair and beauty as, as that's that's what I love talking about, writing about, talking to my friends about. So it was just an, a natural extension of that stuff. Yeah. And I think it's something that everybody likes hearing about, too. I know. I do. I do. You <laughs> help me out a lot. I need all the help I can get. Um, exactly. so how did you start the Small Things blog? Um, where Where did you get the idea to start a blog? Yeah. I, I um, Thank you. My, my sitter just put my kids down for nap and left me the baby monitor, so that was my distraction, but now I'm totally here. Um, so I started it in 2011, like I said, and I was doing hair. So uh, I've only ever worked as a stylist in a studio, like small business, I owned it setting. I never worked for a big salon, so I had to do all of that stuff myself. I had to manage uh, my clientele. I had to get clients and take care of everything that goes with owning like a studio one person salon myself and when my husband and I moved to Raleigh um, in 2009 I was kind of getting that off the ground and starting from scratch and I had a lot of time on my hands and I started reading blogs in like 2010 and I just was my eyes were open to this huge world of like creativity and these great ideas and everyone was just sharing stuff that they were good at like, this is really cool so I started a couple like just good for nothing junk like oh here's one post and then it died but then in 2011 is where it really kind of solidified and I'm like I'm gonna write about um, in my mind I thought just like small things that brighten up my day like a, a new lip gloss or um, hey this is a cool nail polish color so it was really simple quick posts a funny story maybe something that I thought was funny um, so I started the blog by just reading other blogs and thinking well I'll just write about I don't know, little things that I like, but I didn't have a direction for it. I didn't know, um, I, I was doing hair and that was my primary focus. So it was just sort of a fun hobby side thing that I did. That's awesome. So um, when, did you, when did you start to see the blog really take off? When did you see more direction and, um, and find your focus for the Small Things blog? Yeah, so I was doing hair 
And starting out sort of, I was like a year in, there's a lot of space in my schedule between clients. So I would take the time to share with them like how to curl their hair. So I'd, I'd do the haircut, whatever they came in for that service for, and then be like, hey, do you have, what do you have going on this weekend? If they had something, I'd, they'd ask to see like a simple updo or a simple half up style. And I'm like, all right, you hold the mirror. I'm going to turn you around and show you how to do it. And so I would do that with a couple of my clients and then you know, send them off and they'd be back in six weeks for a trim or, or whatever. And I'd say like, how did it go? Like, did you do the updo that I showed you or did you curl your hair? How was it? And they would always say like, I totally forgot everything you showed me how to do. And I'm like, dang, I spent all that time showing you. But if you're only showed one time and then you go home, sure, you forget it. So I started looking on YouTube. There has to be a resource for this. Like, there has to be someone that's done these like really simple, straightforward tutorials, no fluff, just like get right into it. And pretty much all I found was like really not something I would feel comfortable sending to my clients. Like here, here's a professional resource for you. Um, it was a lot of like 11 year olds and um, <laughs> it wasn't great. <laughs> So, I, so my intention was never to be in front of the camera. I was like, I can find this resource. This resource is out there for sure. But I couldn't find it. I couldn't find one I was comfortable with sharing with my clients. Um, so I started filming them in uh, 2011. It was like summer, spring. Um, I was like, I'll just do these really basic just for my clients, but I'll put them on the blog so I don't have to email this huge video. That was the thought. It was like, these are for my people, whatever. It, there was no plan or strategy at all. My first one I filmed in front of like the computer camera and I didn't know how to edit anything. And so I, I knew I had to do it in one take. And I only curled like the first five pieces of my hair because I'm like, no one would watch a whole tutorial. <laughs> now I realize differently, but uh, my mindset was just so messed up. So I did like 30 videos because I had to execute it in one take and it was just so painful. But um, anyway, so that was how I started doing a video tutorials and I put them on the blog again for the clients. But, and at this point I only had like 10 blog readers, but Pinterest came into the scene <laughs> and I thought, Oh, Pinterest is cool. And I sort of snuck my way into Pinterest was when it was in beta. But so Pinterest is exploding and I'm like, Hmm, these videos are helpful for my clients. Surely there's like a handful of people that maybe these would be helpful for as well. And so I pinned a couple of them to Pinterest and that just exploded everything. And I was like, oh, there's a void for this. Like this is helpful for other people that I don't even know, that don't even live in the same country that I do. So that was what was um, the big direction of 2011. Okay, well, I'll help people with this because I love doing it and there's a need for it. Um, so that, to answer your question, long story, that was where I discovered I'm going to go that way with it. I'm going to be hair tutorial girl. Um, Pinterest was a huge factor in that. So it was the timing, and I think it was the, the lack of um, straightforward tutorials done by a professional on their own hair. Because there was tons of videos of stylists like, doing other people's hair, which is like, that's cute and fun to watch, but how do I do it on myself? Right. So, yeah. Yeah, it's funny you say that too because I was talking to my sister earlier today and she knew that I was that we were meeting at Fresnel Chat and she said um, that she would always take photos of your hair. Like she would visit your blog, she found you on Pinterest, yeah. photos of your hair and take it to our hairstylist and say, I want this. And he'd say, I keep seeing this girl everywhere. <laughs> our hairstylist had seen it over and over again. Oh, that's so, so funny. Too. But, um, but I think you, I love that you say that you focused on helping people first um, and meeting a need, and that's how it took off. Um, because did you, I'm guessing um, you never expected it to take off quite like it did. That was never your original intention, right? No. I didn't know, uh, no, I had no idea. I mean, this. I'm the least strategic person on the planet. I had no, like, hidden agenda. I didn't want to, I always thought I would just do hair forever. I thought I would do hair until I had kids, I always wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. I never thought I would work and stay home, kind of juggle both. Right. Um, so I, I, I had no big grand plans for this. It was like, I don't know, this is fun. And I didn't even know you could monetize sites. But then later in 2011, I was like, oh, okay, maybe I could do, like, join an ad network and run some sidebar ads. And then I also sold 
sidebar ads to like Etsy shops and small business. And um, I, let me see here, my sister and I were doing a small business at that time as well. So I had a big heart for that and still do. Um, but my first ad was $10. It was $10 for a month. And I was, I remember telling my dad, I was like, dad, <coughs> I just made money on my blog. Like I made $10 to put a sidebar ad out there. And he's like, that's great, honey. And now it's changed a lot. But yeah, so it was all just learning and diving in and seeing what other people were doing. And I was like, all right, I don't know, I'll try it. We'll see what happens. So yeah, I've been winging it for about five years. <laughs> well, as it, as it started to grow, I'm imagining that, um, that it was a little bit of a shock and a whirlwind at first. But then once you got started, um, how did you go about growing your audience or did you really even have to put much focus on it because Pinterest was taking off? Yeah, I'd say I was in a really unique situation with the Pinterest factor and I, I, I make no, like, I didn't have to work very hard to gain exposure at the beginning because, because of Pinterest. Um, but I think what I realized pretty quickly, I'd say within a couple of months of gaining this, this readership and feeling like, okay, I'm here in front of my computer and I'm putting content out there, but there's so many eyes on it. I started to kind of step back and think, what do I want to be? Do I want to be like information or do I want to be like your friend? And so I, I thought, let me take the friend approach. I'm, I'm a pretty open person. And um, if you follow me on Snapchat, you know, cause I just talk about bras like every day. <laughs> um, and uh, I wanted to be, really approachable and, and come off that way and, and really have people feel comfortable asking questions and be the resource. If, if their mom never taught them that stuff, um, ask me, I'll help you if I can. So in terms of maintaining maybe a readership or uh, maintaining um, like being fresh on people's minds, I just wanted to really take the position of we're the same I just happened to have this database of beauty stuff because I did this for a living for many years and was still at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so just come and if it's helpful, great. But I, I didn't have to initially try because of the Pinterest factor. Now, I've certainly, it's been interesting to see kind of the, the numbers as far as any other bloggers watching. My peak of, of daily views was back in like 2012. So now it's calmed down a little bit, but it's maintained like a steady level. So there was definitely, I've already peaked and I, I doubt I will again, not in a negative way, but just the way blogs work. So there was like that ex initial Pinterest explosion and then it kind of settled down and it's been pretty consistent for, I guess, the last four years or so. Yeah. So when you, when you hit that peak, how often were you blogging? Did you make it a point to post consistently? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I think for a while I was doing six days a week. Um, and it worked well because my husband was in school. Um, he was studying aerospace engineering, you know, a light subject. Yeah. <laughs> he was studying constantly. I mean, he'd get home from school like 10 at night. We had no kids. We had one cat. Um, yeah. And we got the cat because I was like, I'm bored. I was doing puzzles, <laughs> walking, playing with my cat, going to the salon. Those were like the four things I would do during the day. Um, and, yeah, so I posted six days a week just because I was – I had so much to share and I was so excited by it and I loved the feedback from readers and um, I feel like so conversation and interaction has moved more to social now but back then it was blog comments and like that was where you could gauge popularity within a blog and I just loved interacting in the comments and it's changed a bit and I don't think it's bad it's just changing mm -hmm. um, but yeah so it was six days a week and then there were certainly times over the year that I'd be like, this is too much. And I bumped down to five and then I throw a random Saturday post up there. So, um, but yeah, I'd say in general, I've maintained that. I try and post about five times a week, some seasons of my life, like right after having a kid or, um, my first trimester of both pregnancies, I get really apathetic and really emotional. So I'm like, it's better that I don't post as much right now. <laughs> like they just take a breather. So I, I like that there's flexibility, but, yeah, mostly five times a week. Yeah. So would you attribute the consistent posts, like having that database of resources, like you said, and tutorials, and also just filling that need, would you attribute those mainly to the growth? And um, of course, Pinterest, but yeah. in terms of maybe what separated you from other blogs, because there are millions of other blogs out there now. So what would you attribute most? Yeah. To Sorry to interrupt. Um, I, I know what you're saying. And 
I think, yeah, consistency because people, there's this, especially now, it's oversaturated by just millions. Mm -hmm. But having something new to read every day for your reader is important. And um, blog posts are changing. You know, back then it was sort of more important that they were quite lengthy. It's always important that they include an image, I think. Um, but it was more like these long, thoughtful blog posts. And now people, I just think, are not spending as much time reading blogs as much as they come. They want to see, you know, all the blog titles now are like three steps to blank and five things you need to do this summer. So people want just these snapshot posts. Mm -hmm. So it's changed a bit. But I think being consistent and being present is important. And secondly, sort of responding to what your readership is asking for, whether you have to try and figure it out or whether they're making it really clear and like literally asking you for things. So um, one thing I've maybe not been great at is including drugstore options. Um, and I've talked about this from time to time on my blog because I get requested uh, for drugstore dupes often, but it's, it's hard for me to do that when I have like a really good high-end product. I'm like, but this is so great. So there's things I could certainly do better. Um, but I think listening to your readers and seeing what direction they sort of want to take it, if, if you're in line with that, maintaining that as well and just being fresh on their mind. Yeah. So you said your first, for monetization, your mm -hmm. first step for doing that was that $10 ad. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but how did you go about um, increasing that and eventually turning it into your full-time job? Well, yeah. part-time yeah. being a mom, but... Full time. I know what you're saying. I'm not funny about that. I know some people. <laughs> I know what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I ran those sidebar ads first. And I was just looking at what other bloggers were doing, and that was what you did. You had most people had a loaded up sidebar of these little square, 300 by 300 pixel ads. Um, and then in November of 2011, I signed with Blogher, an ad network, um, and that that bumped my revenue up quite a bit because it was different served ads versus just these monthly flat rate. Right. Um, so that was how that changed. And then since then, I'd say, while ad revenue is still a way that I monetize and, and probably makes up for about 50% of my income, affiliate links and partnerships with different brands that I've talked about in the past, those, those are different ways I've monetized it. Um, and so, and then it, it got to a point Oh, I can't remember. Let me see. I had David in 2013. I stopped doing hair in 2013. I'd say the majority of 2013, the ad, not just the ad, the revenue from the blog was over my revenue at the studio where I did hair. So I was mm -hmm. like, well, this just also makes sense for a lot of reasons. Like, not only do I want to stay home because that's important to me, mm -hmm. um, but I could also, I don't know, I didn't know if I was going to continue blogging because I didn't know what motherhood would be like, but it's like, geez, let me capitalize on this right now. It's something I love and put time into this while I can, and then let's just see what happens after the baby gets here. Right. So, so how has it been, speaking of that, mm -hmm. how has it shifted over, since 2011? Because it has been five years since you first started and since things really started to take off. So how have you changed with your audience and with these different seasons of life now that you have two cute little boys? <laughs> Thanks. It's changed a lot. I feel like I've changed a lot. Um, and most of that I think has been since Luke's birth. So David is two and a half. Luke is about 16 months. Um, and I feel like maybe this last year has been the biggest amount of change for me. I don't know why, just in, in variety of aspects. But um, I think the with my life changes, I've, I've always um, felt really personal with my blog and wanted to, like I said, you know, 15 minutes ago, wanted to be like your friend and we're the same and let's talk about stuff that we like. So naturally, being pregnant, which was a joy for me, I loved being pregnant, um, I wanted to talk about that. It was a really exciting stage of my life. So I worried, though, that people would get annoyed by that and be like, you're the hair blogger. Why are you talking about this now? But I just kind of made the decision. Or I processed this with my husband and friends a lot. Like, I may lose readers, and that's okay. I care about writing about this stuff. So maybe I'll then get new readers that care about motherhood stuff that never cared about hair tutorials. And I think I've seen that happen. 
Mm. So, and there's, there's certainly been insecure moments of like, but what am, what am I doing? No, this is not what I want to be doing. Um, I think that's just when you own a business and when it's personal, you can't help but think that. Um, but I feel really confident in the direction it's gone. And I like the variety in more lifestyle, family, um, those kind of posts mixed in with the hair and beauty stuff for a couple of reasons. One, I think it's just nice to read a variety. Mm. Um, and two, I've, I've, I feel a little bit like I've exhausted a lot of my beauty resources. I'm starting to feel just to be honest, mm. a little bit like tapped out of that content. And I don't know if that's from being outside of the salon and not being in the hair world or just like I've, I've kind of covered it a lot and I don't want to get repetitive. Mm. Um, so anyway, so I like the variety in, in adding more like motherhood and kid posts. Those are, um, require much more thought just as far as like, protecting my kids and not oversharing because that the mommy blog world is really strange. And um, so it's, it's, it requires more thought than like, here's lipstick. You know, it's kind of not controversial. So those are easier to write. Right. Um, well, I love lipstick. I'm sure it could be controversial for some, but uh, anyway, so I like the variety. I think it's changed as my life has changed. It like catches up to where I'm at here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I, I think too, especially for yours and what kept me initially, what got me to your site was that I really loved reading or seeing the tutorials and watching the tutorials. And that's what caught my attention. But then in getting to know you through those, like you said, really friendly, personable tutorials, you were doing it yourself. So it made me feel like I was capable of doing it. Um, and so I think your personality is what keeps people hanging on um, and your in your talent. So you use those to help people and then yeah. your personality and then people want to get to know you too. And that's why they care about your boys and your life. And where I remember when you quit your job and there was a big response from that because people have been following along with you for so long and felt like they really kn know you even mm -hmm. before talking to you. I felt like I knew you. Um, yeah. And I think the video aspect of that is, is a big thing. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, a, there's, YouTube people that just they their main platform is YouTube. There's bloggers, and there are certainly a lot of people that are YouTube and blog, like pretty much hand in hand. But the video nature, and even if it, even if it was just here's a helpful hair tutorial, you're still seeing me or whoever else you're watching. You're seeing them, hearing their voice, hearing their inflections, maybe seeing their sense of humor or whether they're really um, loud and lively and exciting to watch or kind of more quiet, soft-spoken, like you just really get to know them more through the video. So I think that's why um, a lot of readers feel that is because they see me and you, I don't know, it's just more, just like this L chat, like you see and you can talk to them and it's different than like reading a typed out interview. Yeah. It's, it's a lot easier too um, mm -hmm. than sitting down and reading a long post. Yeah. I think something too that helped was that you are in all of your photos. Like they aren't just generic photos. People begin to recognize you in your photos as well. Mm -hmm. That was probably a big part of it. And speaking of when you're talking about things being controversial, like lipstick isn't as controversial. <laughs> um, I'm sure that the bigger your audience grew, the more negativity started to pop up every mm. now and then. How have you dealt with that? How do you handle um, the trolls out there, or some of the negative comments that might sprout up from time to time? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's, it's an unfortunate one that needs to be asked. And um, I can't tell you how many times I've drafted a blog post, just sort of putting a big monologue out there about it because it's just uh, so frustrating. But I never publish it because I don't know if that's, I don't know if my blog is a place to kind of address that. But because um, sort of my, my answer there is some stuff, and I'd say the majority, really can just roll off my back because I'm able to step back and look at what it is. And I don't know if it's just the way I think or um, my personality or just practice over these years. Um, I've not yet, other than blogging, I was never in like a, a critical type of position. My, my clients were always um, great. Like I never had awkward situations of people saying anything really mean when I was doing hair. So this has been the only role I've been in where you're sort of in the public eye. Mm -hmm. And um, people are very brave behind the computer screen and, and probably more rude and disrespectful than they would be in real life. But for the most part, I can be like, you know what? Mm. 
okay, that's not that big of a deal. Some stuff does really bother me and some stuff can stress me out and then I spiral into like, I don't need this stress. Like this is such an unfortunate branch of what I do. I'm just trying to help or like provide a small outlet while you drink coffee and break from your work day. And so I, when I'm thinking through that, that's what I tell myself. Like what am I actually doing here? And when I think through what, what I started the blog for and what I want it to be now, that's what it's about. And people that are, um, you know, if a comment is left that is just left to um, annoy me or it isn't like a, a personal jab, it's just like, um, I don't know, I can't think of an example. Uh, oh, here's a perfect example. Justin wrote uh, his post about his climb to Mount Rainier uh, and it went up yesterday and I came across a comment that was, cool story, bro, yawn. And I was like, well, that, that is just the dumbest thing in the world. <laughs> like, why would you write that? And so those types of comments, and I get those a lot, I'm just like, well, I think what's happening here is they're frustrated about something and they're taking it out mm -hmm. on me. Not always, sometimes it is directed per, at me as a person, but those general kind of mean, useless comments, I'm able to let those slide. The really personal, hateful ones, um, they can cut a little bit and I have to really work to not focus on those. And that can look, look, look like literally reading through positive comments and reading through emails I've gotten from women that are like, you helped me get out of my mom's slump. I'm like, I know that mom's slump. I am so glad I helped you. So I have to actually go through and read to kind of get that negative stuff out of my mind. Um, but another tangible thing I did, and I don't know, however many of you that are bloggers are reading this, there's, um, there's, a few, I think, um, I know one hate site directed at um, for, like threads and forums, endless hundreds of just hate and evil and a lot of sadness, I think, is really what it all boils down to. Mm -hmm. I used to check that from time to time. Um, and I used to think, well, this might be some constructive feedback. Let me just take this for what it is. And then I realized this isn't constructive. Like this, this benefits me in no way. So um, it's been two years since I ever checked that site. So I have to also just really tangibly make decisions to not go to the, the forums in which their, their enjoyment for a really weird reason is to just tear people down in really inappropriate ways. Um, but then when I get comments on my own site, I don't mind leaving up critical, um, I disagree with you, I don't like that post, that's fine. I don't expect everyone to agree or think everything's the, the best way it looks um, if I'm sharing on the site, but particularly abusive or often comments left just to like ruffle another reader's feathers. Mm -hmm. like just, no, just, we're just going to get rid of this. So it's, I think it's a daily balance, not daily, but from time to time I have to kind of step back and be like, how are the comments doing? What's going on with people? How am I doing? Yeah. Yeah. That is, I know oh. that was a lot. No, I think, and I asked that because I knew everyone tuning in would benefit from it, but it's something that I've, um, I wanted to hear from you too, because I have that same feedback, same site. I think that you're talking about, okay. um, yeah. not, not visiting it anymore. Um, yeah, yeah. And, you can't. It's, it, it's not helpful at all. It really isn't. And, and I used to think that it was, and now I see that it really isn't at all. And I also really believe this, that um, people are, I think, I really believe the phrase, hurt people, hurt people. Mm -hmm. And also, they're basing their comments or uh, opinion on what they see online, which for me is really personal, but only a fraction of my actual life. And so sometimes when things feel like they particularly cut and hurt me, I'm like, man, but imagine if my friend said that to me. That would really hurt. Oh yeah, this is a stranger. Yeah, oh, yeah. This person doesn't know me at all. My right. friends' comments and feedback would is much more important to me because they actually know me, um, like m me as a whole person. Right. But, yeah. And when the majority of comments are great feedback, it's amazing sure. how that one terrible comment can take precedence in your mind over all of those other really glowing comments that you can get. But it's just, and it's not fair. And it's, it's, 
it's very natural to do that for some reason. I, I remember being at a blog conference and John Acuff said, don't give, he either said it's unfair, or some, somehow he said, don't give more weight to the mean comments or the hateful comments than you do to the positive ones. I'm like, it's true, but it's so easy to give those more weight because I, I have surely been to my, said to my husband like, ugh, everyone hates today's post. It was just like one, one comment that was like, you're terrible. <laughs> Suddenly everyone, everyone hates it. I'm like, no, Kate, it was one person and that's fine. They may think I'm terrible. Okay, then I'm terrible. Everyone else seemed to enjoy it. So there's that. Like you just kind of have to leave it there. Yeah. And I'm sure over time it gets easier with <laughs> each yeah. comment tends to just, you know. Pass yeah. Down. You get a thick skin, which again, I'll always say this, it's really sad that that exists on the internet in general, but you have to. Um, and yeah. So in some ways it gets harder because it's like exhausting. Like really, mm -hmm. are we still doing this? Um, but in other ways it's like this, this exists. It's, it's a part of the job and yeah. You just have to really periodically check yourself and make sure you're not getting hung up on it. Yeah. Part of putting yourself out there. So. Yeah, it really is. So what advice, before we jump into some of these questions that, um, that people have been leaving, um, what advice would you give for bloggers who are just starting out for creating a memorable, successful blog? Yeah. Um, this is, I always think, whenever I've been asked this question in the past, I always think really hard about it because... I started out by just sharing stuff I cared about, and that doesn't seem like a really great answer. It's not profound to your question, but that is the best way to start out because that will be the only way that you write about something with passion and enthusiasm. So if you're a blogger starting out, you have to write about what you care about, even if it's maybe a borderline uncomfortable, like. If it's something you're passionate about and you care about it, that's what you have to write about. Um, and I think people in this sort of oversaturated blog world, there's a lot of this. You can find a lot of the same type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. If you search like the beauty section under the blog love and like suggested posts, it's kind of all the same. But if I had to ask myself, and I, I wish I would have done this maybe sooner whenever I've dealt with, like, well, everyone said it all already. I have nothing to say. People read will read your blog because they want to hear your thoughts on it or just the way you talk about it. Like, why do I read the blogs I read? And I've asked myself this question. I don't maybe necessarily care um, for, like, the exact data they're including in their blog posts. I just want to read what they're saying about it because I care about their thoughts on things. Um, so you have to write about what you care about and what you're good at um, and write about it in a way, I think, that's conversational and shares your, um, your like, thoughts and feelings about it because that, that will come through in your writing. Don't mm -hmm. overthink it. Um, there's, there's so many directions that if you search on Pinterest, like how to write a good, good blog post, you'll find a million responses. And there's certainly things you should include. Like I really think everyone should have a photo and, um, space out. Don't have long paragraphs because people will get bored. Like short couple sentence paragraphs are important. So there's certainly logistical things that you need to think about, but, um, people are reading blogs because they're not reading magazines anymore. And the difference between a blog and a magazine is a blog is a blogger. Mm -hmm. So they want your personal voice in it. So they can just read a magazine and get information, but they don't know who wrote the article. They care about who wrote the article on the blog. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That's my yeah. I um, actually wrote a newsletter yesterday about what, what do all of the most successful memorable blogs have in common? And for me, it boiled down to the person behind it, but also helping people. Like, I feel like a lot of people now either want to be entertained or they want to be educated or they want to be able to take something away from it um, that's helpful for them. And I can say this because I'm a blog reader, but we tend to be selfish. <laughs> there, it has to be kind of something in it for us. So yeah. like there are tutorials and, and I love that that's how you got started too, is just to help people. Yeah. Um, and then it kind of took off from there too. So considering like ta what is your talent, your skill set, and how can you use it to help other people? Um, and a lot of times the more you see it help other people, the more passionate you become about it too. I oh, think. absolutely. 
Yeah, that's with my experience too. Yeah. So, thank you. That is great advice. Um, are we ready for the questions? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Hey, can you hear the baby monitor? Luke is just chatting up a storm. Is this? Is I can hear it just a little, but I don't mind it at all. I'm sure. I'm sure no one else does either. <laughs> let me mute it while you get the questions ready. Let me mute it. All right. Sounds good. He woke up this morning literally meowing in the crib just <laughs> meow, until someone, until Justin was downstairs, but I got him and I was like, you are my child. <laughs> if you're meowing in the crib. Okay. I love it. I have a cat too. I can't hear him, so go ahead with the question. I love that. Okay. So the first question is um, from Chris and they say, if you are starting a brand new business, what should be your first post? So their example was that if I was beginning Ellen Company today, what should my first post be? What image should I choose? And what kind of text and message to start for building an audience? So yeah, um, that I I like that question. I I would say don't put too much thought into your first post because man, that first like month or two of blogging, you're gonna once you get into it. You're going to really see like, oh, I don't like writing about what I thought I was going to write about and I really like going this direction with it. But your first post I think should introduce who you are, um, maybe why you're starting the blog. And um, I think there needs, I think at least in the beginning there needs to be a picture of your face, whether that's in that post or just on your main page so people can see like, oh, the human behind the web page. Um, but <laughs> one thing that I always see in those first posts they're like, I'm going to post every day starting today. And it's hard to maintain that. So don't make unrealistic claims. Like just say, here's my intention. I'm starting this blog because fill in the blank. And I hope it's helpful. If you have questions, let me know. And totally honest, it's, that one doesn't matter as much as the ones after that. Because anyone could oh, start a dot blogspot blog today and write one post and then if you never touch it again it doesn't matter what you wrote in there the stuff after that really really matters so don't overthink it but introduce yourself who you are what you want to do here why you're here and then continue posting at a rate that you think is reasonable yeah I love that you say that because I've seen that trend too and it it oh, does I did oh I did it too when like I the first three my blogs first I started yeah it was like Hi, I'm here, guys. Welcome. I can't wait. And then I never touched it again. Yeah. It's like how I started every journal when I was little. <laughs> hey, my name is Lauren. I, <laughs> it's similar. Yeah. But it is going to get buried, and I hope people don't go back and look at anybody watching this. Please don't go back and watch it. <laughs> go back to my first post. Like but. two years after, it was like 2012 or 2013, I came home from a blog conference, and I, we were talking about the first post. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wouldn't it be funny to do a dramatic reading? of your first blog post. So I did that. I need to find the link to it. I did a dramatic reading of my very first blog post and then like, you know, put it on a new post on the site and was like, this, this is what this one is for. Like, this is just for humor now. That's all right. I think, and too, it's just important that you get started and put mm -hmm. content out there and, and just start sharing. But that's a great question. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And Kate. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, Colleen says, I have a hundred plus ideas going around in my head and I don't know where to start. Suffering from serious information overload. Do you have a simple five-step formula I could follow? So mm. how do you pare down on your ideas? No That's a great question. I am not a formula person. You can ask uh, my assistant who I don't know I, how I lived without. <laughs> that I'm not, she would say I'm not a formula person. I'm not strategic. What I would say um, and what I've done is maybe look through your ideas and, and list out maybe what topics you care about and want to write about. And I, I like variety. I kind of get bored of the blogs that are the same thing every day. Like um, I, I rarely check food blogs every day, but I'll do like binge reads a couple mm -hmm. times a month. It's the same kind of stuff. But other blogs that include a variety – more lifestyle blogs, even some beauty blogs that have different posts. Um, those are my dailies. Like, I'm going to see what they're doing today. So variety is good. Don't feel overwhelmed by it. Um, but think about what will what p other people will also care about reading. Just like you were saying, Lauren, like we're, you're reading a blog. You're selfish a little bit, but like you're looking for something that you can connect with. So it has to matter to you. Right. Um, and... 
Yeah, so I think you have to critically look at if you do want the blog to become um, something, whether you want to monetize it or not, but if you want it to become something that you have a regular readership and this is something you do, you, it has to be something that other people are interested in as well, but you won't be able to write about anything you don't already care about. So mm -hmm. I'd pare it down a little bit. You don't want to be too broad because people will get lost and confused. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's okay to have some variety and just like maybe print out like a blank calendar and space out like food. I don't know. I'll just give examples like food post Wednesday, another day of beauty, like just kind of space it out throughout the month. Um, yeah. So I don't have a fo exact formula, but you'll also pare down naturally as you blog. Like, the more you write about it, you'll realize I, I in fact don't like writing about that as much as I thought I did, you know? Yeah. And you'll get to know your audience and figure out what they like and, and have a better idea of the posts that they'll respond to and, and want to. Absolutely. Um, I know, too, I have, if you're talking about blog post ideas that you have running around in your mind, too, I tend to list mine out in whatever ones I'm particularly excited about writing. I'll start with that because usually if I'm excited to write about it and I've been thinking about it for a while, it comes a little more easily than those. I'm like, oh, I really don't want to write that, but I know I should. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, another great question. All right, we'll continue rolling through these. Okay. Veronica um, says, I just began blogging and I'm doing the best um, to have good content, but my big concern is how I get the attention of brands to collaborate with me or notice me. Um, what move do I need to make to get their attention? Please help. This okay. Um, that's, that is a question I probably get asked the most in regards to blog, blogging as your job. And I can't remember, I should know this, I can't remember the first project I did outside of a project that was set up within my ad network. So the way BlogHer works is they run sidebar ads, and these are other ad networks as well, but I'm with BlogHer. They run sidebar ads, and then they also pitch you campaigns from um, brands that they're working with, so they kind of set you up together. So straight up, you have to have a, a, num a readership that would matter to the brand, um, because it's a marketing tool is what it is and it has to make sense for you of course as well but in terms of getting noticed by brands um, a lot of times you have to look at your site from why would they use this as a marketing tool what can I offer them um, and you might need to sort of write that in your pitch email I, I, I think it's okay to pitch brands that doesn't scare me um, and there's a lot of resources for writing a pitch email that are really helpful. But you might have to, when you're starting out, explain, here's why it's really valuable to work with me. Brand, fill in the blank. <laughs> um, here's what I offer. Here's the demographics of my readership. This is what happens when people read my site. And you might have to lay it out for them because they may not know who you are yet. But more importantly, I think it, the initiative to start your blog, because you said you were just a beginner blogger, I'd say for right now, I get the excitement about monetizing that, and I, I had a different mindset because I didn't know you could monetize it, so that was never in my mind, and then that sort of hit me. So I'm starting from a different point than you are, Veronica, but um, focus on your blog content because if your blog content is really great, your readership will likely grow, and that will be the way you connect with brands. You can still pitch to them right now, but realize your, your content is where you should be focusing versus writing a bunch of pitch emails. Yeah, I love that you love that you focus on content. I feel like if you make content your primary focus, everything else will follow. Well, yeah. Airs and growth and all in working with brands. So. It will. Awesome. Sydney says, how do I gain a network of followers rather than just people who view my blog here and there? How did you build a loyal following, Kate? That's a great question. Um, I think, especially nowadays, with uh, Instagram, Snapchat, and Periscope, I don't know about Periscope. I don't know if it's going to stick. I thought it was, and now I feel like it's dying yeah. a little bit because of Snapchat. But anyway, um, I think in order to gain loyal followers, you sort of have to be present on, I would say, at least two, one of those being Instagram or Snapchat mm -hmm. platforms. I don't think you have to be really active on Twitter, super active on Facebook, doing the Facebook Live videos, Snapchatting every day. Too. You don't want to do too much because you'll end up exhausting all of your ideas too thin on too many platforms and you won't have the good stuff for the blog, which is where it should remain. 
I find that sometimes I'll periscope and be like, that would have made a really good blog post, but I said it already. <laughs> like, okay, I'm going to have to go back and do that. So don't spread yourself too thin because your stuff's going to get watered down. Um, but a network of people following you, they're likely, if they're a blog reader, they're likely following the blogs they read on social media as well. And I think it's important to be present there as well. Um, and I think each one of those serves like a really different purpose. Um, Instagram for me is like not the beautifully curated every photo matches and has the same filter and we all have the same color in each photo like that's just not a reality for me there's no way I'm gonna take time to do that my blog stuff I try and have like it's pretty much the same artistic vibe but Instagram is a big variety and I'm cool with that snapchat's like kind of a disaster <laughs> um, but like that's what I want each of those to be like snapchat is my casual like I don't think before I snap Instagram, I think a little bit, but it's this peak at like background stuff, little things like more my life, less beauty stuff. And the blog is like primary beauty stuff and then some of those other lifestyle posts like I've mentioned. So think about who you, what part of your personality or your, or your vibe online, how you want to kind of spread that out over those platforms. And then they'll all sort of work together really nicely. Um, but it also just takes time. And I think it's important to respond to people commenting on your site and see what they're reading and ask them. One of my favorite things I've done, and this wasn't strategic to gain more blog comments, it was a real authentic way to ask people, but I've started including questions at the bottom of some blog posts like, so what's your favorite? Because I'm just over here spewing all my favorites, like what do you like? So, and really I think the value in blog comments is dying and the value is being seen more in like number of followers other places mm -hmm. where it used to be like how many comments does she get to determine how popular she is and that, that I think is dying a little bit but interacting with your commenters in the comments whether you have two or 200 is important because they're taking the time to write to you and if you have an answer or you can reply I think it's important to do that as well and people will feel more connected to you yeah I love that you mentioned comments too because so often in blogging it can it's a one way conversation you're sharing your likes and your thoughts but the comments make it a two way conversation back and forth so I love that you mentioned that they do All right Shelby says my question is all about time management what tips do you have for streamlining the workflow of a blog, especially in the beginning? I just began blogging. I'm feeling overwhelmed with all the new things to learn to learn and adapt to. The nitty gritty of technology has never been a strength of mine. What tips do you have for first time bloggers that will cut down on any necessary unnecessary work? And then what does a typical work day look like for you as a blogger? So first and foremost, how do you what does time management look like for you, especially as a mom? Yeah, um, so I'll answer this question in a mindset of before I had an assistant, since you, what was the name of that commenter? Or, Shelby. Shelby. Assuming you um, are not yet in a position that you have an assistant, so I, which until I hired Nicole, which was in the fall, or last August, um, I was doing it all, one woman show, everything. So I totally get what you're feeling like. Um, and geez, five years ago, I think that was before Instagram was even really important. Like it was Facebook and Twitter. Anyway, so I'm starting at a different stage than you are. But um, as far as time management, I think gauging what to work on, you have to think about what's going to be the like the meat of what you're doing. And for me and for you, if you're a blogger, it's your blog post. That is what you have to spend your priority. Like if you're a morning person, get up in the morning, work on your blog post. When your mind is fresh, if you're a night owl, work on it then. Do like the other logistical stuff that might not be fun in other times of your day that you can just check off the list. Mm -hmm. um, but focus on the content. I feel like I've said that a million times, but that's ultimately what the blog is for, right? So focus on that. And then the other like uh, social media push, all of that stuff, there are so many applications now that can do all of that automatically for you. And I am in a stage of life now as a mom, even with Nicole, but let's say Nicole wasn't present. I am in outsource as much as possible mindset. Like what can I outsource? <laughs> I'm going to outsource it. So for social media and often for, I think everything Nicole and I are doing for social media stuff is free. There are certainly sites or um, like applications that you can pay for, but there are things you can set up to just automatically go. 
So if you hate that stuff, Shelby, uh, and I'm sure Lauren, I'm sure you have a resource for this. Um, but, but there's, there's, it's just so easy to find like Hootsuite for Twitter, like different things that you can just go and spend time. Let me just plug away and push, set up my social shares here, and then it'll just go. So you can check out, and just have all that stuff working for you. So it's it takes time to find that stuff, and you'll have to learn um, just by trial and error. Um, but don't don't feel. I would say don't put the importance of blogging on like I have to get all my stuff out there. Focus on getting it out there, but focus more on what you're actually writing and like taking photos of because that's what will get shared more. Not like well, I've seen her post this article six times already on Twitter. I'll go look at it already. That's not the kind of reader you want. You want the reader that's like, I read this and it was awesome, and so I'm going to tell my friends about it, mm -hmm. or I'm going to share on Facebook or whatever. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I thought that was great. Okay. Buffer is a really good resource. Um, yeah. It doesn't do what, or it doesn't do Instagram, but Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, you can pin from it now. Oh, nice! I didn't know that. I knew Tailwind was like a Pinterest oh, wow. scheduler, but Buffer. So, and for Instagram, I use Latergram. Yes. Which is an app. So you can queue everything up and then it'll pro it won't automatically post for you, but it'll prompt you and say like, Hey, your post is ready to go. Copies and paste everything. So later gram is a big one for me. Yeah, I think that's great. And did you find that the more you blogged, the easier it got? Like, do you have a system now for writing your post? Do you outline them ahead of time? How do you, what does that look like for you? Yeah. Um, it's, I don't feel like I have a system. I think that's just the, the nature of being, like super creative, zero type A personality in my soul. But my, um, I've started scheduling out an editorial calendar, a, a loose one, like two months in advance. And that has helped me so much because I can just see a picture of what kind of stuff I'm putting out that month and look at it and then fill in the holes where I'm like, well, let's do some variety here. And this week has no makeup stuff. So let me put a makeup tutorial here and then a review of this product that I liked and this one that I didn't hear. Um, so sort of stepping back and looking at what the month looks like has helped me, but I, I'm the queen of starting, I think at this moment I have like five posts in draft, shot, edited, title, and I've talked about, I've included links to all the products I've used, things I'm excited about talking about, but I haven't finished them or written like the copy for it. Which is just funny. So it's I I love starting things and I'm a bad finisher. So my system maybe would be I try to not leave those drafts for too long because I'm obviously shooting it, doing the actual tutorial or, or shooting whatever I'm talking about because I'm excited about it. Write about it when I'm excited about it. So mm -hmm. try not to let them get too far away from me. Um, but I definitely like shooting stuff and um, explaining a little bit of like what the product is instead of writing like the intro and like here's what I have to talk about today. That stuff's really hard for me. I'd rather just, I think that's why videos work well for me because I can just talk about it and I don't have to think about how I'm, how I'm writing like the actual text within the blog. Yeah. I love that. I think I'm the exact opposite where I'm very oh. tired and I have to have a system. Like I outline the post first or I come up with the title first and then I outline it and then I come back. I mean I have like a whole system. Which oh, is we are opposite. Me, but yeah. But not for everybody, so it depends yeah. on how you work. But there's certainly pros to doing it the way you do it, and there are cons to doing it the way my, I do it. Because I'll get ideas for a blog post if I'm like at the grocery store, and so I'll write it down in my notes, and then I'll go home and start it, and I'm like, oh yeah, and then it's just like, I'll finish that tomorrow. It just hangs there. So, but there's there's bad things about both about both. I think it's personality type too, but it's interesting to see how everybody goes about it differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but great question, Shelby. I hope that answered it for you. Um, all right. Suzanne asks, how do you avoid or minimize spending a lot of great inspiration posts in the beginning when you don't have readers on your blog? When you're planning to start a blog, and in my case, hope to turn it into a service business, how do you avoid writing a lot of great stuff in the beginning that just gets buried underneath the posts that you write later? So okay. How do you avoid? Good question. Um, I wouldn't try and filter what you want to write about because it'll. I think it's really easy to see that. But instead, maybe try and create a couple series and and write about maybe do like a um, 
you say you, you're hoping to turn it into a service business. My mind just went to home organizer. I don't know what you're going to do. I just know I need a home organizer. <laughs> so if I was a, giving advice to a home organizing blogger, do a couple series like attack, um, how to attack the like kitchen and bathrooms of your house and then write about that. And if you feel like, man, that was good, like that offered a lot of really good information. I mean, I'm going to space something out here. Do like shorter, also helpful, but shorter posts in between and then do extra social shares. I think of that, that original stuff that you felt really good about. But if you're writing something and you find yourself thinking like, this is really good. I don't want it to get buried. I think you should still keep writing about it and don't worry about it getting buried because if it's really good, it likely won't get buried. Mm -hmm. And that you can do in a really logistical way by like putting favorite po or popular posts on your sidebar or like things other readers are really loving. I always like reading those posts because if other people like it, I'll likely like it as well. Um, so don't, don't overthink it and don't avoid writing what you naturally feel yourself wanting to say. Um, and then maybe do what I do where you take a look at your month and space out the posts you're really excited about. And then thinking about those naturally is going to make you think about, well, what, what goes in ha hand in hand with that? Um, your favorite cleaning products or something or how you keep your room tidy. Like there's little branches of these big meaty posts that you're excited about that you could spread a little bit, if that makes sense. And I think the, the really good content that you're excited about, you're never wasting it because that's how your blog is going to grow. I mean, if people want to see those great posts in order for it to grow. And chances are that you're going to get better at whatever it is you do in that amount of time and you're going to have other thoughts on it or you might come back to it and write about it again. I know there's been posts that I've written and I'm like, oh, I have something to add to it now. I'm going to write about it again. Yeah, for sure. And you can do that. There's no rules. Like if you've changed your mind on something, that's okay. And if you want to like, hey, I wrote this, but I have more to say about it, write another follow-up blog post about it. People will love that. Yeah, I loved your series idea too. Kind of spreads it out a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay. So we'll do one more. Okay. All right. So we talked about getting noticed by sponsors, Cindy. So I hope that answered your question there. Um, Katrina asks, what is the best way to drive traffic to your blog? I post on social media, but I'm not seeing the conversions over to my blog. So what would you say, Jess, Kate? I think, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously going to say Pinterest is the best resource for that. And I think for a couple of reasons. One, well, Pinterest, maybe, I don't know this for a fact, but my guess is it's not as popular of a tool as it was back in 2012. Um, 2011, 2012, but you can just click through so quickly there. And if you're posting on Twitter, that it is just one click, but people go to Pinterest to see things and to look for something, whether they know it or not. Even if they just go to Pinterest and they're like, I'm just scrolling, they're still looking for something. They just don't know what they're looking for. So you can set them up for what they're looking for. Or if they're going to look for something very specific, like a recipe, um, if your stuff is there, that is a great place to find it. And there are a lot of ways to make Pinterest or make your images more pinnable. There are things to do and things not to do um, with Pinterest. And I think, Lauren, you have several resources for that, right, on your site? Thank you. I have some Pinterest resources. Yeah. I think, too, that if you're going back to content, if your content is really good, I mean, I share my posts on, on Pinterest, but... I have a lot more other people share my posts on Pinterest so yeah. like, of my audience. So if you, my, what I hold to is that if your content is really good, people will want to share it once they do find it. Um, it's true. And it's the photos I think are, are really important. Um, and I don't say that to overwhelm any of you that are starting out. You don't have to have an expensive camera, especially with like iPhones or Sam. My husband had a Samsung device. Like it doesn't have to just be an iPhone either. Um, but the, there are ways to take photos of things really well and really bad. Go to all my archived posts and see how to do it really bad. Here lately, I've been doing a little bit better, but um, that that is really important. So whether it's a, just a tweet, including a picture, people just want images. I think that's obvious with Pinterest success and Instagram, and even Snapchat, even though it's video, people just want, they want to see real stuff. They don't want to read as much anymore as they want to see and like really understand what you're talking about in a real sense. So. 
um, put a little emphasis on that. And then like Lauren said, you're, if, you're, if your content and your post is good and you're in it, like it's personal and people feel, and that doesn't mean heavy or deep, but like if you're sharing a recipe, why this recipe is really great if your grandmother made it and people will love that, that you're a real person and they'll feel connected to it. That is going to get shared more than just like a catchy title or right. clickbait for crying out loud. Yeah. <sighs> That's the worst. Clickbait is driving me crazy on YouTube. It's, it that's is. all that it is. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. Anyway. And, and people will get frustrated and then they'll never return. No, no. You've, you One and done with clickbait. If you want to kill your blog, use click, clickbait in the title and it'll yeah. be over. Yes. Well, awesome. Well, um, it is a little past two and you have little ones that are getting up from naps. So we will let you go. But thank you so much for joining us today. This is really fun to I know normally speaking about beauty and, and hair, but um, it was fun to hear your feedback on blogging. So thanks. thanks. Thank you for having me. This is I you know, I've been doing this for so long and I feel like my blog, a lot of readers are not bloggers. So I have so much to say and talk about with blogging, but my my site I don't think is a good like channel for that. So this was really a pleasure and enjoyable for me to be here. So thank you for asking me. Thank you. It was great to get your feedback. And thank you all for joining in today. I hope that you really enjoyed it. Um, I know personally I did getting Kate's feedback. But I would love to see you in another L chat soon. If you click on um, I think my face is somewhere on here, up at the top, my account. You can see the next upcoming L chats, and I'll post about them too. Um, usually Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I'd love to see you in here. Thank you all for joining me, and I hope that you have an awesome week. See you later.